Um, hello, my name is Alicia Walker and I am calling this meeting to order as co-chair. Governor Baker's extension of the March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group. Given that we have a quorum present, I am calling the July 1st, 2021 meeting of the Community Safety Working Group to order at 5.31 p.m. I will call upon each member of the working group by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Um, Ms. Deborah Ferreira? Present. Ms. Pat Ananabaku? Present. Mr. Darius Cage? Present. Mr. Russ Vernon Jones? Present. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to review the agenda. Uh, we will first hear any public comment that members of the public want to provide to the working group. We will not respond to your comments, but we'll listen to your comments carefully. We will then hear comments from members who may have something to report for this meeting. Um, we have designated the last part of our meeting um, to see if we have any follow-up from last meeting of things to go over. Um, so I just wanna take a brief minute to go over public comment if we have anyone looking to public comment at this time. I have to stop the share to go in and see. It doesn't appear that anyone has their hand raised at this time. Okay. okay, and so does everybody feel comfortable in moving forward from the public comment section? Okay. Um, so I want to do a quick review of the agenda today for our, on our agenda we have um, the recommended agenda items for Mr. Vernon Jones. Can you see the agenda? Yes, thank you, okay. Ms. Moisten. Um, priorities of the second part of the charge, IFB phase two, the resident oversight board, and recommendations from part one of the charge, um, a follow-up. Um, so I would like to uh, just take a quick minute for members reports before going into the, ag the agenda. Um, so this is a time for members to update us on any work they are doing or any events that are coming up. Does anybody have um, anything that they would like to share? Can you just end it? Uh, yeah, sorry, Miss okay. uh, Miss Pat. So, um, uh, let's see. So, on the um, traffic stop project, uh, Brianna and myself were still working on it. Uh, we're hoping to get that ready for you uh, for you to look at as a draft next week meeting. And in terms of the standing committee, uh, we're still, myself and Alicia, we're still researching and working on that. So hopefully by next week, you guys will be able to get something and give us input. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Owen? Um, so I wanted to report a couple of things. Um, to follow up, I know Ms. Pat brought up a meeting the time that we met in person. Um, there was a small group of people who are interested to meet to give some feedback on the implementation of CRESS. Those people were Lauren Mills, Lev Ezra from the Survival Center and Shalini. Um, I wanted to report back to the group some of the notes that I took from the meeting and some concerns from the community. So in, some of them are things that I didn't think about. So I'm glad that I attended that meeting. So one thing that Lauren Mills brought to my attention was um, what work are we doing, the CSWG, to bridge the, bridge the gap and uh, make sure the community trusts Cress. Um, she was wondering how long our group was going to be extended as that might be a way to help the community trust the program. But Lev also offered ways that the Survival Center may be able to help um, another thing that she brought up too was the dispatchers for the program because the resolution and the motion put forward by the town council includes 
the number of responders, but it doesn't say anything about the dispatchers. Um, from the perspective of Lauren Mills and the dialogue that we were having, um, there was an emphasis on how important it is that 911 calls can access Crest, but also that we have a separate number and that we don't compromise that. So it was really helpful to meet with her um, in that regard. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Sorry, did you have um, other things that you wanted to share? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I will let you finish. No, it's okay. I feel like I have a lot. Um, also, I wanted to let the group know that Thomas Grossman um, from the Board of Directors at the Boys and Girls Club wanted to follow up with the Community Safety Working Group to see if we were interested in having a conversation with the Board of Directors and other, um, org not organizations, but I think groups that serve young people. Um, I wasn't sure where we stood with our successor group and what the next group is going to do to um, start doing the work for the Youth Empowerment Center and the Cultural Center. So I was wondering if group members were interested in that conversation or um, if not, if maybe that's something we have our successor group do. Ms. Pat? So, okay, so a um, couple of things. One is that the town manager, the town council did not mention um, youth empowerment center program that we have proposed. And I'm not sure what is it that we'll be discussing with Boys and, and Girls Club uh, board. Because at this point, um, it's up up in the air. So I'm I'm not clear as to why we're going to be meeting with them. I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I also did some research a little bit on um, our town website and was looking at social at uh, social services grant funding that the town gives to different programs. I noticed that boys and uh, boys and girls club sometimes even when they submit grants, they don't get it. So um, if the town is not even supportive of this group, I'm not sure, you know, what is it can, that CSWG can do to, to work with this board? I'm, I'm not clear. Um, I think Ms. Ferreira had her hand up and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, in terms of uh, this specific question, um, I think probably in terms of prioritizing, I would rather leave that to uh, the successor group, I guess, if we're not gonna be the ones that are gonna be kind of following up with it, because you know, I think in terms of priorities for me anyway, would be the, um, the second part of the charge and obviously getting the consultants on board to, to work with the second part of the charge. Um, so anyway, that would be my kind of feedback on it. Um, you know, I think it would be an important conversation to have, but I think later in the process, because whoever's going to be kind of putting the pressure to make sure those other recommendations, uh, you know, come to fruition would have to be the one to kind of take those follow-up steps. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Mr. Vernon Jones? Deborah said what I was going to say. I completely agree. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also in agreement with that, Brianna, if um, that I think it would be okay to, if we decide that that's an important thing to have happen, that we can leave that to the successor group. Um, just because we're not, we're not so far along in figuring those things out right now. Um, and sorry, I also want to leave space for you to continue your members report if you have additional things to say. Yeah, I can definitely let Thomas Cross or Tom Crossman know that. Um, I think that'll be really helpful. I also wanted to um, report to the group that Alicia and I did meet with Irv Rhodes over the last week, and we included the feedback that he gave us through our conversation in the packet. Um, he brought to light some really interesting questions around the Crest budget in regards to where the funding was coming from. And he also included um, meeting guidelines because I think he was hurt by what we said at one of our prior meetings because his personality was attacked rather than his ideas. I don't necessarily think his um, 
his comments were coming from a malicious place, but I did communicate with him along with Ms. Walker that the timeline that he sent them in and the way he included counselors made it feel like that. So I wanted to report to the group that, and I wanted to be transparent just because I think that going forward, it's really important that members of the community aren't discouraged to send us stuff and reach out to us and be a part of our work. And several council members were discouraged by the way that we talked, to him, talked about um, his comments and recommendations during our prior meeting. Um, Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Pat. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Mr. Rhodes, Irv Rhodes also, he, he outreached to me before I left, um, you know, sending an email saying that he wanted to talk to me. And I've been transparent before that Irv and I have been friends and, and you know, previously and everything. Um, so I was, I was in the middle of kind of getting ready for this trip. So I didn't have any chance to even respond to him, but I do plan to when I come back, have a conversation with him. Um, but for me, I think the issue, and I think I made it very clear, you know, um, when I discussed it was the timing of everything, right? Everyone has a right to their opinion. Uh, you know, not everyone has to agree with what we're saying and what the recommendations that we made or anything, but it was the timing. The timing was very, um, it, it, it was just problematic, you know, and both timings of, of, of you know, the, what he sent out. The first one being right the, the night before we had to present to the finance committee. Um, that was not okay. And then we had to take the time instead of you all, especially you all, the chairs having to prepare for it. That we all had to take the time. I had to take the time to like look at what we we're going to respond to him and so on and so forth. That was not okay. You know? So for me, again, it wasn't the opinion. Everyone has already the opinion. It's the timing and the fact that, hey, why don't you come and talk to us, at least touch base with us first, being that we're a majority BIPOC uh, group. You know, it would have been very respectful to have done that and then, you know, done whatever you had to do in terms of your opinions and so on and so forth, right? Um, because I just thought that that was very problematic and, you know, and just really kind of um, made our, our, you know, the work that we were doing a gazillion times more difficult. And also being that he is a black man in the community, he's someone that is very much respected in the community. Uh, it being that he's been in, in politics and stuff, that the timing was not good. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Ms. Pat? So what I wanted to say is that I do not have any regrets about what I said that day. And I can only speak for myself. All I did was to raise concerns re regarding the content of his letter. I never attacked his personality. I don't think anybody did. But we did discuss our displeasure about the content because it was divisive in the community as a prominent you know, black man in this town. So um, that's what I wanted to you know, say. I, I'll do it all over again. Our group's supposed to be you know, bound by open meeting law. How else can we discuss issues in our meeting. We're not allowed to have a private meeting, you know, behind closed door or, you know, outside, you know, public uh, realm. So this is opportunity for us to discuss issues that pertain to CSWG. I did not believe that we attacked, you know, his personality. We discussed our displeasure. Again, I'm repeating myself about, you know, the content of his email, which I felt was not helpful. Um, especially the fact that uh, what we're trying to do in this group is to benefit BIPOC community, which he is also a member. And I, I did address the same thing with Black group through my email that I sent to, you know, our community, Black, black community as well. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, so I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more, Brianna, sorry, if you have anything else before you continue, um, just to say that um, Brianna and I were able to meet with Mr. Rhodes. Um, and so I think we were, we were able to come to some sort of understanding on that ground um, in terms of the way that he received um, the conversation that we had and in terms of the way that we received his email. And so I, I do think we came to uh, like a ground of understanding not necessarily agreement, but understanding. And so I think, um, <clears throat> I, I feel actually really 
a lot better about, about having that conversation because we didn't have um, an opportunity to interact with him. We did only receive the email. And so it was just a way to hear out his thinking um, in a more personal way. And I think it was really helpful for me. And he actually did give us some specific feedback um, or questions that may be helpful to to speak with the town manager about that I was hoping to get to at some point today. I don't know if right this minute is the appropriate time, um, but just that the conversation we did have with, with Mr. Rhodes was, was quite interesting and informative. Um, and, and Brianna, uh, Ms. Ferreira? Sorry, I mean, I don't wanna belabor the point, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think the part of it is, is you're right. I mean, you know, my biggest issue was like, why didn't you do that? from the beginning, right? You know, you don't just send out, you know, all of those problematic kind of statements he made in those emails, especially the first one, just don't send it out to the town manager and key uh, council members the night before the finance committee when the budget is gonna be decided, you know, without talking to any of us, you know, especially since he knew, he knows me, I'm on the, on the committee, he knows me, we've been friends, for many years, why wouldn't you approach me and talk to me? You know, I have a big issue with that. I'm sorry. And I'm not, and, and as Ms. Pat said, I'm not going to take that back. I'm not going to take mm -hmm. back anything that I said in regards to it, because that was very divisive. That was very problematic. Mm -hmm. And it really made our job a lot more difficult. I mean, we're a majority BIPOC group dealing with reforming and creating a whole new process and recommendations, dealing with the police. The police has been one of the biggest uh, uh, departments that have been oppressing BIPOC people for centuries. And so, you know, uh, that that was just very, very difficult. I appreciate the fact that now he's come and talked to us, but I wish it had happened before, you know, because it, it just made life very difficult. I was very disappointed. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Mr. Vernon Jones. I just want to express my appreciation, Alicia and Brianna, to you and to Irv for getting together and uh, seeking to come to some understanding, even however great the disagreements may be. Uh, and I think we, you know, in public life, we get to have disagreements, we get to have major disagreements, but uh, I, I appreciate your having the dialogue and I think that was a good step. Um, thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, and then I want to hand the floor back over to Brianna. I'm not sure if you were finished yet with your members report. That's all I have. Okay, okay thank you, Brianna. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to share with the group? Ms. Ferreira? Uh, yeah, I mean, as you all know, obviously I wasn't able to do kind of a lot of um, work being that I'm in Cape Verde Islands right now, but I did want to bring up one thing that I know, and I have to kind of read up more on it, but as you all know, there was the, um, in Massachusetts, the act uh, relative to justice, equity, and uh, accountability in law enforcement in the Commonwealth, um, which is something I think we want to look at because it kind of deals with chapter 253, um, you know, in, in the federal register, I mean, in the, the Massachusetts register, that kind of deals with a lot of uh, kind of, you know, use of force and everything um, in terms of reforming the police in Massachusetts. So I think we want to take a look at that, especially for the second part of the charge. But I don't have all the specifics once I have more. Obviously, I think it, it should, we should weave it into the second part. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Owen. Yeah, I don't have a lot of detail about this, but I know that there were some things proposed for that state bill that did not get in the final bill. And as we look into it, I think it'd be important for us to find out what were the recommended provisions that did not get approved in that bill and are they ones that we might want to recommend or get approved locally? Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Owen? Um, a community member suggested um, that we take a look at the Brattleboro, Vermont community safety report that they did. Um, their table of contents includes things like a commitment to anti-racism all the way to community calls for action and tensions and readiness between the police and the community. It's very similar to the work that we're doing and um, I'm going to take a look at it and try to summarize key points to bring back to the group next week. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Um, 
Is, are there any other members who would like to share something at this time for a member's report? Um, okay, uh, so the first thing that we have on the agenda for today is the recommended agenda items uh, from Mr. Vernon Jones that are attached in the packet below. Um, and so I know we sort of have already looked at a few of these things. And so this is just a time to briefly come back to them if there's anything we didn't get to cover last week. Um, and I absolutely would like to take this time to double back to the first thing on the list, which is the request for an extension. Um, see and the document? So I do not, I think I just see a desktop. Oh, yikes. That's All right. a busy desktop, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It says screen two. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Yeah. Um, so yes, I would like to double back to, to number one on the agenda uh, or on the proposed agenda items um, in our request for an extension. Um, and Mr. Bockelman was available is available and is here at today's meeting. Um, so I was hoping to take this time to engage in further discussion um, regarding our request for an extension or the status of that. Um, and Miss Owen, I'm sorry, are you raising your hand? I'll go after Mr. Bockelman. Okay. Um, uh, so I just wanted to take this time to engage with Mr. Bockelman to see if there is an update as to our request um, for an extension. So thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I would like to know more. I missed the second half of your meeting last week, which I apologize for. I think it was last week, whichever one. So, and I think um, I tried to get up to speed um, on, I didn't watch it actually, but I looked at notes. So if I can understand more like what that includes and because I'd like to have a conversation about um, whether a consultant is going to be helpful to get to the end zone or not. And I, and I under, and so the consultant is one piece and then, but I also do recognize the time and the con time constraints on where we are. And if I could help, if you could help me understand a little bit more where you are in terms of what's the work that needs to be done, it seems like where you've identified that where you want to put your energy, um, it's going to take more than two months. So if I could understand that a little bit more, that'd be helpful. Um, yes, I would like to give other members of, of the group an opportunity to also answer that question. But I just wanted to beforehand just in my opinion, or the way that I'm viewing this, the, the need for a consultant and the need for an extension are two separate things. And so while I think they're both true that we have a need for a uh, consultant and a need yep. for an extension that even if one were to determine that we didn't need one, that the, the other one is still, they're both needs at this Agreed. time and not Agreed. necessarily yeah. dependent upon each other, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Agreed, yeah. And, um, I also am just, I think I, for me to answer that question, I would need more specifics as to what exact information is needed in order to determine uh, if we would be like per se eligible for an extension, because I think we've been very vocally clear about what things we would like to research, um, that we would need somebody with a specific set of expertise in order to thoroughly look into these things and to provide quality recommendations. Um, so that those are just like some very short brief reasons why we would need a consultant and an extension. And so I'm just wondering like what specifics do you need to know in order to make that decision? Yeah, so like let's let's start with resident oversight board. I think the things I had noted that you have looked at or you've identified as your sort of working topics, and correct me if I'm missing any, was the resident oversight board, traffic control, community policing, and successor body. Are those the key? Did I miss any? Uh, Miss Owen, I think those are the topics that we agreed last week that we could get started on now doing individual research. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other things that we would need help from consultants with, like the policies and procedures and the legal aspects of that in the APD. But the traffic control, community policing, and 
to start to take um, a look at the resident oversight board was something that we could do now is what I was under the impression of. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Ms. Owen. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I confess to being very puzzled by this conversation. Um, my recollection is, Paul, you were with us in the last meeting when we went through the uh, draft of the uh, what we had titled originally as an IFB, uh, and we did not delete anything from that. So as far as I'm concerned, everything on there is something that we have interest in pursuing ourselves. Uh, and I thought we had talked about you were developing a, uh, an RFB that would include those items, uh, plus whatever other items you thought might be relevant uh, further down the road. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. I wasn't sure um, if that was like a, a, a question directed at Mr. Bachman that you wanted to wait for an answer or if I should move to the next comment for now. Okay. Consider it a statement. Thank, thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Ferreira? Yeah, and I guess I just wanna back up uh, what Mr. Vernon Jones said because um, uh, Ms. Owen was very kind to kind of send me a, a brief summary of what you all had discussed last week. Uh, so for me, you know, time is of the essence, right? And we've been saying that for these last couple of weeks, Mr. Bachman. And from what I, my understanding is that you all discussed that and turned it into this RFB. So Mr. Bachman, I don't understand why you're asking us those questions again. My, my, my thing for you is, you know, get that in or let us know what needs to happen so we can get the consultant and what, and what we need to know as, as um, Ms. Uh, Walker said, it's two separate things. A consultant needs to be in because we have all that work to do and we need an extension. You see what I'm saying? I mean, those are the things that, that, that we're asking about. So I don't understand why you're still asking questions about what do we need help with? I think last week they were very detailed in terms of what we need help with. Um, thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm, I'm in agreement with the members who have already spoken and I'm wondering, Mr. Bachelman, if it's possible to be like as specific as possible in what information you would need from us in order to make that decision. So yeah, I think it's, it would be helpful for me to go through it one by one. Um, so at least because work is already being done, right, on some of these topics. And are we looking at a resident oversight board and, you know, from my experience with the group last time is you did the bulk of the work and came up with the recommendations on your own, which were, were very community specific and uh, resonated with the broader community. So, um, and, and, and it was informed by the process, of course, of the consultants, but, you know, I felt like, um, and so I guess what I would like to know, when, not what I'd like to know, I want to, I, I am like what I've said in the past is that I really want to move on a few of these things as we take them on. And so, and then there's a lot of bigger topics that we have to continue to work on. Uh, the resident oversight board is the one that's sort of foremost because it's the one that's been articulated. And, um, and so what do we need to get that group up and running? And I don't think we need a consultant to do that. I think we can get the charge written and start to recruit and get that project going. Um, relatively quickly and it doesn't have to wait till the end of your term either you can you know develop develop that in advance and i think it seems like I've, I've, from the notes i've seen it looks like you're fairly well along in what looking at what that group looks like so if we stay on that one topic is that where we are on that miss owen for me, I'm thinking consultants are going to be so important for the development of the um, the resident oversight board because we need to know more about the policies, procedures, and tr trainings that need to change. But we also need to know more about the day to day. And all of the members on this group are, are we're all working. We don't have time to ride around in the back of the cop cruiser and see what day to day life is like. And I think that the report that we finish now is critical for the resident oversight board. We can't just put them together with no knowledge on the work that we've done and changes that need to happen. And I know that there's also legal implications and barriers to the reforms that we may make into actually happening. 
which I think a consultant group would be really helpful to help us with. Yeah, I agree with Ms. Owen. And I also just wanted to add um, something that you actually brought to us, Mr. Balkelman, as a really interesting suggestion, trans transferring this to an RFB rather than an IFB, because the amount of work that would would require someone with expertise for the second part of our charge is a lot greater than that of the first part of our charge. And that this is gonna be a really, um, a really timely investment and in that their work, the work of the consultant may extend beyond what our charge is, especially if we don't receive an extension. And so that was the sort of the things that were, the conversation happening around changing this from an IFB to an RFP. And so I think all of those things still remain true in that we will need the support in order to make those recommendations. And I believe it's imperative for those recommendations to be in place before the implementation of the resident oversight board so that they can monitor those things as substantial change and so that they can monitor the complaint process and what good is a complaint process if we haven't even changed the things that were already being complained about in the first place. Um, and so just a way for them to sort of monitor the progress on those things um, and that they also as a group will most likely need to utilize the work of a consultant or an investigator or other, another group separate from themselves with certain expertise in order to carry out their charge. And so I think that those are things that we like agree on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we agreed on those things. Um, and then one other thing, like I agree with the urgency of, of creating the resident oversight board and I believe it's urgent to have this happen as quickly as possible. Um, but something that I thought about after last meeting that's a little bit confusing to me is what is the rush in implementing this when we haven't even included them in this fiscal budget? So there is no money to pay them if we even set them up or for them to even be able to do anything. So why not give us the time to figure this out and to set it up so that we can get it in place so that they can because if, if we hire a consultant, that, that is most likely going to take up a lot of the money that was set aside for this kind of work. So I'm not sure how we would find funding for the consultant team and for the stipends of the people on the resident oversight board. And those are things that really need to be worked out before creating the resident oversight board. Um, Ms. Ferrer, I believe I saw your hand up first. So, um... You know, I guess I'm sounding like a broken record from like two weeks ago. And I guess, you know, last week you all talked to Mr. Bachman. So Ms. Bachman, um, you know, I know that your interest is the resident oversight board. I've, I've heard, we've heard that, I've heard that over and over again, but there is a lot more besides just the, the resident oversight board. And you're giving us only a small amount of time because you don't want to extend the work that we're doing. Therefore, it's even more critical and more crucial for the consultants to be on board as quickly as possible. So I'm not understanding why that we're having this kind of, you know, misunderstanding. I know that for you, you just want us to focus on the resident oversight board and that's that. No, that's not the only thing. And, and the group has even in terms of last week, from my understanding is that they're even willing to take on, you know, some other research of some of the other areas that we think are priorities. Because again, you're only giving us a small amount of time. So we're having to, to work double time in order to get things done because you're being very, you know, um, you know, not, not wanting to work with us about the extension of, of the time. So my thing for you, and I need to ask you, like, you know, just straight up, like, you know, why I, don't you want to give us a consulting group? We already showed you all of the information, all of the work that needs to be done. And it's not just the resident oversight board. You, you gave a charge that was very expansive. I'm sorry, that's what was your charge. And I am taking that charge to heart. And that's a very serious charge. So stop just focusing on the resident oversight board. It's not just that. And that has a lot of work still to be done as all the other members have already talked about. That has a lot of work and everything else on there has a lot of work to be done. So what is going on? Please, please just be straight. And, and, and let us know what we need to do so, so we can get this done. So I, th I will, I, I, what, I'm, what I feel is happening is we are making substantial changes in our operations, which is really important. The CREST program is a big, big 
big, big project. I mean, I was on a call today with um, Albuquerque, which I think is maybe our most likely model because it's a separate standalone. It's not the Cahoots model, it's a different model. And they, and I'll share that link to you with, for you. Um, but that they talked about the implementation and the amount of work they put into it. And I think that is, it's, it's, it's challenging and daunting and uh, achievable. And the, uh, the results are, are, are going to prove out to be good. So um, we're, uh, we're, we're, we need to move the CREST program forward. Um, we need to move the, and again, this, this is how I envision the, the, the charge. And, you know, the, the charge was written to really focus on the alternative responder and a resident oversight board. And there were other things in there, but it was very explicit about those are the two major things. And so that's why I'm really focused. Yes, why am I focused on resident oversight board? Because that's, I think that's the biggest structural change that we can implement to help um, move forward on making the changes. And I also believe that, you know, this is a, what we've learned through this process is that this is an ongoing multi-year effort. So a successor group, who, whatever that looks like, needs to be put into place. Um, and I think it's um, unrealistic to think that we will be able to go through all the police policies um, in a short period of time. I think that, that there are so many pieces to the puzzle on those things um, that that's gotta be the successor groups um, if that's what the say, or, or the resident oversight board, whichever group that lands with, I think we need to understand what group that, where that lands, um, that that's going to be the work of the permanent group because they have to take ownership of that. And that's how I'm in seeing this because I think this is, a, we need to set up systems and structures for ongoing um, continuity of, of change. Um, you know, and, so, and, and I know that, you have put a tremendous amount of work in it and, and personal and emotional um, effort. And I, do, I, I, but I see this as being a, and I know you all do too, but a long-term effort. And so that's how I am envisioning that. And um, so just, and you, so that's, that's where, that's where, that's, that's where I am. And so that's why I want to, that's why this discussion is important for me to understand better. And I hope you understand what I'm thinking about as well. Miss Pat. So I don't want to repeat what you all have said, but what I want to say is that this group is so unique in the sense that we're majority BIPOC folks. And I can speak for myself. I think um, the part A, I'm not saying that it was easy to do, but my experience in doing my outreach and people reaching out to me they had a lot to say. They have a lot of suggestions to make. However, with part B, there is a lot of um, anticipation about what we're going to come up with reforming the police. It, it's, it's sort of like a little bit technical. And I'm not comfortable doing the, uh, the part B without having consultants you know, help us. I'm an employer. And some of what we're dealing with will be employment law with uh, 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 employee policies and procedures. And I don't want us to rush something or submit something that is haphazard. I don't, I don't operate like that. I don't know what the rush is. And I don't want to repeat what other people have said. There is no budget attached to this as to rush. Please let us do this very well. I know we've taken on some of the topics for us to work on. Even when we work, work on them, I would very much like consulting firm to look over what we did, discuss so that if we have additional questions, there's a lot involved in part B and I would like us to do it very well. Mr. Buckman, I know you have your own agenda of uh, press program and oversight board. Are you listening to BIPOC community? The people that this program will benefit the most. We're telling you that this is what we're hearing from our people. They want to know what the police reform will be, handing it over to the next successor. I don't know how I feel about that. I respectfully disagree with you in that regard. Ms. Owen? Yeah, I just want to echo what, what Ms. Pat has said. And 
I hear you. Let that's what you want. But you you hired all of us. You pointed all of us yeah. to advise you, and we're telling you no. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I just think back to what Miss Pat said. A lot of community members are coming to us. We're not just making these decisions based off of our own thoughts. We're we are bringing other community voices into our decisions for all of this. And I think it's really important that our groups stay together while Cress even gets up and running because we are the people that developed the program. And the community voices, community pe- people from the community engaged in this work through us. So I don't see what the rush to disband us is. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Mr. Vernon Jones. I certainly agree with what Deborah and others have said about the, the full charge, the importance of it, and our uh, engagement with it. Um, with regard to the Resident Oversight Board, uh, yes, we will drive it forward. We will do as much as we can without a consultant. Uh, and, you know, I hope you're finding money to fund it because uh, I don't think it makes sense to wait a year. Um, but even with that, there are going, I mean, I, I think we really ought to have a bylaw in order to give this board the authority it should have. Uh, and that's another whole piece of research is to look at what different municipalities have done with regard to how they've um, you know, enacted it through law uh, and um, you know, getting that done. Uh, and um, so that, that's a key piece. Uh, and I think there are any number of other details that um, you know, we'll take it as far as we can in the time we have, but I think have some professional help would, would make a big difference. Um, another thing is that I've heard from several members of the town council that they are continue to be concerned about the level of fear and mistrust in the BIPOC community uh, for the APD. And they understand that Crest will reduce the amount of contact between the BIPOC community and the police, but they're really, I mean, what they said to me is they're looking to our second report for some answers about what is going to make a difference with regard to uh, mistrust and fear uh, in the BIPOC community because they want that addressed. And we're obviously not gonna lay out the full program, but I think with a consultant, we're because of the, the BIPOC nature of this committee and the contact we've had with the community over the, the, the many months that we've been working, um, I think we're particularly well suited to try to offer some recommendations there. Um, and I think we'd like a chance to, to try to follow through on that as well. Uh, we're, I, don't, we're not, I don't believe we're talking about a complete review of all police policies. Yes, that's certainly beyond you know, any term that we've talked about for this group uh, or the, anything that can be done in the next few months. But we have identified, and you have in writing and at least two different documents from us, we've identified some specific policies that uh, in across the country have been particularly associated with um, racial discrimination or uh, anti-Black violence. Um, and so we've identified some particular policies that we think would make a difference to, uh, to start with. Uh, but no, we're not, we're not proposing a complete review of all policies. But I think our, you know, that what will be put in the IFB, um, I think it's IFB six is the number, is the, was the name of the, the I have that one, yeah. On the document, I think is, is a pretty good summary of what um, we think it makes sense for us to take on with a consultant. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, Ms. Ferreira, and then I think Ms. Pat also had her hand up. Um, you know, thank you, uh, Mr. Brendan Jones, for, for bringing that up. Um, you know, the fear that the BIPOC community have uh, towards the police and the police department um, is, is very real. And it makes it even more critical in terms of why it is that we need to work, work on the full aspect of the chart. And I've already said this before, too, in terms of the resident oversight board, they're going to have a, a very specific job to do, especially dealing with complaints and dealing with how the, the um, you know, police department, how, how we deal with misconduct within the police department. 
And then, you know, obviously investigations, confidentiality, a whole lot of things that are going to be very specific to it. It's not going to be dealing with them um, uh, addressing all the other issues in terms of reforming the police. And that's those, that was the charge you gave to us, right? So now you can't shortchange the community and just say, well, just focus on the resident oversight board. That's going to deal, that's going to be a big chunk, but that's not the, the, full, the full scope of it, especially given the fact that BIPOC community are definitely afraid of uh, the police and how they interact with our community, especially in terms of intimidating and, and you know, being retaliatory you know, a lot of times being harassing and so on and so forth. I mean, we've, we've already, that was all in, in, in part A, right? When 7th Gen brought all that information and those testimonies and people really being guarded in terms of, you know, making sure that their identity would not be shared because they were so afraid of the police, right? So, um, so basically, you know, again, just restating the importance of dealing with the full scope. So uh, Mr. Bachman, are you going to fund the consulting group? That's what I want to know. Are you going to fund the consulting group? And again, you know, I guess we only have until August. Is that what you're saying in terms of this group? And then there's going to be, quote unquote, whatever successor group that's going to do. I guess we're going to figure that out. I don't know. But anyway, are you going to fund the consultant? So I think the, the decision tree is that um, a consultant won't be able to do any work before um, September 1. Right, by the procurement, there's just no way of doing it, right? Um, so the first question is about extending the, the time frame, And then the question is, if we extend the time frame, what, what level of cert for two months till November 1, I think is what the date we talked about. What is this, what can be accomplished uh, with, a, with a consultant in that time frame? I just wanna make sure that we're talking, is, is that what we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just, you know, I just need, yeah. I'm, um, I think our visions of what the group was going to accomplish are, are different and, you know, and um, where I, again, we said the same things over and over, so I don't need to say it again. And I thought what um, the, the topics that you had identified that you've already started to work on were really important ones, because I think those were the, the primary targets um, of, of inquiry that really needed to be done. Um, and then the question is, the, is, I guess I'm just talking out loud here, and I'm sorry for fumbling, but um, if like, say we talk about resident oversight board, maybe that's not one, a good one, but traffic, the traffic stops. Um, research alternatives to police and traffic control, explore examples around the country of traffic control responsibilities being assumed by entities other than police, explore exam elimination of ticketing for traffic violations. So is that, would that be one of the tasks for that? That would be the, that would what, what we'd want the consultant to do? Is that, if I'm understanding this? I'm sorry, Mr. Balkelman, which document are you reading from? IFB 6, yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the IFB was the the document that we proposed as a final document as a group to be ready. Well, it was initially an IFB, but I think at our last meeting, we decided that it should be converted into an Agreed. RFB, but I think it's yep. in its final form. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if this is helpful at all in terms of the decision making, but just to offer another perspective, um, you mentioned something about making change and reform in action in regards to having the resident oversight board up and running as soon as possible. And although the, it is a very necessary um, substantial change to make, that it will take time um, to get it set up, to recruit the members, mm -hmm. to, to have them all on the same page, for them to start doing research and to actually have their work to start making changes and if you want to make fast quick changes then allowing us to offer recommendations as to reform that is the quickest change that you will be able to get mm -hmm. on the ground mm -hmm. and that then you also mentioned something about having this continuity and this ongoing thing and that that would be what the resident oversight resident oversight board would provide 
after we are able to have the sort of on the ground right away change. Mm -hmm. And so just a different perspective in terms of looking at it in a slightly shifted way, because that was the, the language that you just used in your view. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I don't disagree. I just think that you can think about that also in a different way. So as we start about think, as I'm thinking about implementation, if we start looking at, I mean, again, the CREST program is on, on its path. Um, for the if, the, if we look at a resident oversight board, realistically, um, I think we've laid out two paths. One is to just appoint and get it going. And then the second is to get the legal grounding for it. Or do we wait for the legal grounding, i.e. A, a bylaw prior to getting it? But in either case, suppose we get that, you know, a, a recommendation done in the next two, three weeks, whatever. Um, and if it's a bylaw, it goes to the council and it, maybe it takes a month or two through the council. And then, so we're, we're talking like November one before we get some, get that group up and running, right? And, um, you know, and that would be optimistic because we'd have to get the charge up. We'd start to recruit, um, make sure it was, but if, if that would be a goal say, and again, I'm just sort of trying to think out loud here. Um, and then what you're suggesting, I think, uh, Ms. Walker is to say, well, let's keep work, keep the um, CSWG working so that when that group gets up and running, we can hand them things that they can look for into more deeply or something like that. Was that, was I, was I interpreting what you're saying correctly or not? Um, not completely incorrect, but just more that the emphasis was on our ability to offer recommendations more immediately than it would be for you to recruit, to, mm -hmm. to get together, recruit, start, give a charge, have them be able to accept complaints and do the complaint process, or have them be able to do their own research and offer recommendations on their own mm -hmm. will be quite a more lengthy process than just letting us have an extension to complete that and offer those recommendations. Mm -hmm. And so that, that alternative route will allow you to more quickly put into some put something into place that will offer change and that then this the implementation of the resident oversight board can carry out the continuity of that change rather than waiting for that group to be implemented and for them to have to go through this exact process and for because because we've we've already gotten to this point right so we've been working for months we've gained a lot of knowledge we've gained a lot of connections with the community mm -hmm. and to have another group to then they don't just pick up where we left, left off they then have to create all of those connections and all of the, that building, they will then have to start doing that as well. And so that it's a process for the community to trust them and to want to come to them and to speak with them and for them to know. I mean, I, I don't necessarily assume that these are gonna be all people that have experience doing something like this. And this is, has been a learning process, a very difficult learning process. And for them to have to engage in that same process, I don't see that being like the quickest out for change in this process at all, that it would actually be more quick to allow us to finish, to allow us to give you those recommendations. And so that then the resident oversight board can carry those things out and that would be more continuity. Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand you're trying to figure out, you know, how this works with the timeline and a consultant. Um, my sense is that the things we've identified in that IFB document are things that we will try to move forward as best we can uh, until a consultant joins us on September 1. And at that point, the consultant can take a look at our work and say, oh, you, you missed this, or, or we can say, we don't know the answer to this question, or will you find out what other municipalities are doing here or check on the legal status of this? Um, so yes, we will keep moving these things forward. How much we can accomplish by November 1st is hard to say. If we have a good consultant and a lot of cooperation from the police department, my guess is we can accomplish quite a lot. There'll still be plenty of work to do after that. Um, but I think our commitment is to do as much as we can um, in the time we have. If I... I'm sorry, Ms. Pat, did you want to allow Mr. Bachelman to answer first? Okay, uh, Mr. Bachelman? It's a little bit different topic. So if Ms. Pat is on the same topic, um, I defer no, to her. Okay. Um, 
So I guess one of the questions I that, that that triggered was like, what is the role you see of the police department in this process? Is are they information providers? Are they participants in the discussion? Um, you know, how do you see what what role do you see them playing? Like, would you want them at your meetings on a regular basis to be engaged with the conversation, or is this something that's wholly separate from the police department? Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, if you would like to answer that. Well, I mean, we, we may all have different notions of that, but uh, the seven gen group identified that it was important for a resident oversight board to be successful. A good relationship with the police department in setting it up was important. Um, I don't think we want the police department coming to all of our meetings. I do think we want to have delegates, a subcommittee, our chairs, whatever, meeting with the police fairly regularly once we get going on this, um, partly because we want them to buy in uh, to what we're recommending. We want, if there are particular issues or stumbling blocks that they see because of their experience, we, we're going to need to know about those. Uh, with regard to some of the policies, um, my guess is the chief already knows some of what's in the state law, what are the current policies, um, and, you know, we need to explore, you know, I, I don't know what the best recommendation is around consent searches. I think we ought to be doing something, um, but I think we need a dialogue around a number of these things. Um, so on the one hand, we're trying to create an accountability that has not existed. Uh, and yet simultaneously, we need to be building a relationship uh, where the police department understands that it's in their interests to cooperate uh, and that we offer the best shot at them being more trusted by their community that they've mm -hmm. got. Um, and hopefully Scott can, can lead in that direction and work with us as we develop things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Ferreira. Thing is, Pat. Uh, I've been raising my hand for a long time. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And Pat. then I'll go, and then I'll go after Ms. Pat. So go ahead. So again, I feel that it's still a disconnect as to what the BIPOC community wants and what we're discussing tonight. And I'm getting frustrated. I think that um, regardless of what um, our, when our charge will end, we should not lose sight of other aspect of keeping BIPOC folks safe. And that is setting up another standing committee to ensure that BIPOC community are receiving the right services in this town. So in addition to oversight, we're all talking about you know, crisis intervention, press program, it's all great and good, but we're not talking about prevention. I just feel that I'm wasting my time here when BIPOC folks reach out to me and telling me you know, what they would like to see. And we come here, we're told, you know, we just want oversight board and we want CREST program. Even with the CREST program, I can tell you right now, it shouldn't be a surprise, it's, it's creating anxiety among some bike folk folks because they said, who do they call? You know, does CREST program have phone number? And some people are saying they wouldn't even try to call CREST. Where is CREST going to be housed? Is Bank Community Center, is it BIPOC space? I mean, these are the questions that have been raised. And where, you know, we spend so much time, you know, discussing um, when our child will end, what we're going to discuss, and why are we not listening to people we are advocating for or people who will benefit most? This is not just only crisis and intervention. We also need to talk about the diversity, inclusion, and diversity, equity, and inclusion department program, and also the standing committee. There's a lot that we need to talk about. And in addition, most bike folk folks get in, uh, interaction with police through traffic stops. I mean, how are we going to do this without you know, getting the help from um, consultant to help us you know, find out the trends? 
nationwide and do the right thing. I can tell you right now what I'm leaning towards. I don't think the police should be doing traffic stop anymore in this town. I, I also think that I should not, no longer be um, writing off any um, tickets. It needs to stop. You know, people can do like a volunteer work or donate to the charity. You know, I have a lot of ideas in my head already. I think there should be transportation department just to deal with, you know, traffic and um, dealing with, um, what do you call it? Tick, you know, when people go to park and things like that. I don't think police should be doing, you know, traffic uh, stops at all. They should stop doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Ferreira? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm feeling the same frustration that Ms. Pat um, just discussed in terms of just obviously, and we've been talking about it, right, for this past two weeks, that there's an urgency in us doing um, the, the, the second part of our charge really well is very important uh, for all residents, but especially for the BIPOC residents. Um, we need to be able to kind of look at all of these aspects and not just the aspects that you want, um, Mr. Bachman. It has to be all of them and we have to take the time to do that. And I know, you know, you're trying to rush us and, you know, I guess I, I didn't even know that you kind of extended it uh, up until November 1st, uh, but it, it needs to be done well. Because when you ask, well, is the police, should the police, are the police going to be involved in so, you know, in, in these discussions? My thing is, well, it may be because we're getting rushed, right? So if we're getting rushed, I'm not going to be taking the time to talk to the police. I'm going to be focusing on, hey, we need to hurry up and get this charge. You know, we need to get these recommendations done and blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? Because that's going to be my focus. My focus is not going to be talking to the police department. But yeah, I think it would be good for us to, to have discussions with them, right? Because as Mr. Ernie Jones said, that for them to have the buy-in and so on and so forth. But that's not going to be my priority. I'm sorry, it's not. If I'm being rushed to, 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 you know, because I'm not gonna focus, and I'm telling you right now, Ms. Bob, I'm not gonna focus on just the oversight board. I'm gonna focus on the full charge. That's what I was, when I was, was, was chosen to be part of this committee, that's what I was told, and that's what I'm going to do. You see what I'm saying? And so if that's the case, then that's gonna be my focus. It's not gonna be talking to the police. So then, yeah, so then there's gonna be a part there that won't function well, right? because we should be having a dialogue, but we don't have time to have a dialogue. So that's the thing that's frustrating. We keep on telling you these things, things that are necessary, and you just keep on coming back with, well, why do you need to do this? And why do you need to do that? We've already said it, we've been saying it for these two weeks, but you're not hearing us. And that's what I'm frustrated about. Why aren't you hearing us? That's what I wanna know from you. Sorry, was I just muted the whole time? Not the whole time. You no. muted right at the end, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank so, you. Am I, no, but my question is, why are you doing this? Why are you, why don't you want to, you know, have us look at this charge thoroughly and have us have the time to do this work thoroughly? Why? I just want to know that from you because we, we won't be able to do our work well. I think what you can, well, and I'm trying to listen better and, you know, I think um, in trying to process information better. And, but so I think that um, at some point, the, the, if, if the charge, the charge said, the charge, I don't have it in front of me, do I? Whatever. Um, Ms. Moisten, can you put can you put the charge up for us to see? Because so the charge said um, the purpose of the community safety working group is to a make recommendations on alternative ways of providing public safety services to the community, and b make recommendations on reforms to the current organizational and oversight structures of the Amherst Police Department. So organizational and oversight structures, and I think that um, you know. I think the other thing that you identified in your IFP was the um, concept of community policing, which I think is an organizational structure. And I think that's that was something that um, has been identified multiple times in the over-policing category of things. 
And I think that that's an important conversa public conversation for the community to have, is that a, a good practice or not? And I think that we've never had that conversation in public. I think it's a pretty big conversation, public conversation that will take time to educate people about and to come to a conclusion on what is the right thing for our community. And, um, you know, APD believes that that is the right thing, but I think the, we've had testimony from others saying that the result of that program, that approach might not, isn't, doesn't create a safe space for us. And so that's, I think, an important public conversation. So I think that that was the organizational structure piece of it. Um, and then we have like, how do you study those things? And then there's a lot of examples of things, tools you can use to study, but those are the two big things. Um, and you did a, um, yeah. Sorry, might we be able to, cause the, the charge continues after the purpose. And I think that it's really important to continue reading down into the working group can can achieve this by. Yeah. And then there's a very specific set of a list of examples in which uh, we would be expected to do this. And I, I know everyone can see them, so I'm not gonna read all of them, but one of them says reviewing policies, complaints, and current training practices. Yes, those are examples of things that you could, tools you could use, right? I agree with you on that. Okay. Um, and, and the fact that the report should have some of those reforms included. When you go to the reports, it says, it says the resident oversight, but also policy reforms. When you say, on the reports. Yes. So it's not just resident oversight. Mm -hmm. So when you say to us, well, you, you're not going to have time to look at the policies, you're not going to have time to look at some of these other aspects that deal with trainings, complaints, you know, and so on and so forth, then we're not doing what you had charges to do. But I mean, yeah. And if I may, on the engaging the community, Jennifer, can you engaging the community? Okay. What it says, identify solutions to diagnose problems. Identify solutions to diagnose uh, uh, problems. And to me, the way I read it before even I applied to be on, uh, on the committee is um, to make sure that I actually hear from people, from my people, from BIPOC people, like what are the issues that you know, we can address. And what kept coming up was youth center, multicultural, uh, BIPOC multicultural center, not to have interaction with the police in terms of traffic. They do not want to be stopped by police. So the way I read it, you know, identify the uh, uh, solutions to diagnose problems. And that's what I'm very focused on because I'm really in touch with my folk folks. I've lived in this town for a long, long time. And people do reach out to me. They text me, they call me, you know, they email me. And I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Ellen. I just wanted to mention that our concern about uh, alternatives to police in, with regard to traffic control is actually part of the first part, part A of the charge. You know, it's all alternative to police for providing safety services. Uh, so CRESS is one part of the answer, um, but the possibility of some alternative around traffic control that would reduce traffic stops and that contact between uh, police and BIPOC uh, communities is another aspect of part A of the charge, really. I, I can tell you guys right now, whatever we're doing, if at the end, the town government, because we can make as many recommendations as we want, but for the BIPOC community, and I can't speak for everyone, if we were you know, done with this work and the police is still in charge of traffic stop, I will tell you right now, it's like our, credib our credibility was, will, will sunk within BIPOC community. I'm just telling you right now, they do not, we do not want to have any interaction with the police being stopped for, for, for minor stupid stuff, excuse me for my language, your speeding, your 
uh, uh, and light is off or something. We don't want we don't want to have those interactions and get rid of and get tickets for that. We don't want that anymore. And that's what BIPOC want. They do not want to interact with police in that regard. It's very triggering for people. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Ms. Owen? Yeah, I guess for me, Mr. Balkelman, I'm just wondering at this point what the limit, what like what is the barrier that you're having trouble understanding? Because I, the money we have it, the details we wrote them out at the last town council meeting, it seemed like most town council members were even in favor of us continuing our group. What what specifically is it that you don't that you, what's the barrier? Um, it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I think there for me it's two things. One is. Um, the the details in the AFP seem really big. It seems like a lot, and I don't think that it, there's going to be money or time to accomplish everything. So that's where I thought you had focused on the sort of core major things that were most impactful on the community, which were the resident oversight board, the successor group, the traffic control, the community policing, as the as the four major components. And and I, I misunderstood what that was. I thought that's where you had, had said we're going to focus. But you said, but I think what I understood what you said today was that's where we're going to start now. We, we, we've right. divided ourselves up to work on that now. So I understand that better now. Um, so and then um, so I think um, that it's sort of it's it's a it's a very large IFB. This is a very large, and there's I think there's no way if we said I, I think that it's it's going to be hard to accomplish. And then um, one of the questions is: Does do you envision CSWG just continuing for a very long period of time, or um, is two months what what you're thinking about? I you know I try to think, fit in what this how you've identified the things that you want to accomplish with the time frame we have. But the thing with the time frame is, is there's no budget implications, so we don't have to have a short time frame. And I'm just confused personally how last meeting we were talking about, you proposed to the group that we move to an RFP, and now we're having conversations about the IFB being too broad. I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, just... It's just, it's just really confusing, and it's, yeah. kind of, it's setting our, our ability to move forward back, because we keep waiting on this conversation, and we need to be able to come to a, a mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, when I say IFB, I just say that as a, as a shorthand. I, what I really mean is RFP. I'm using the IFB because that's the name of the document. But I do me, I do agree with you on an RFP process. But again, even even with an RFP process, if you're there, the specificity of the RFP will matter in terms of the quality and the um, ability of firms to respond to it. Would you be willing to give our group um, time to create a subcommittee and work on an RFP so we can put that forward and then go from there with the time that we'll need to finish our charge? Sure, we can help. We can help with you with on that as well. I mean, that's that's what Anthony does, you know, for a living. And Jennifer knows how to do that as well. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. So, so I, I guess I'm confused. Um, so now you're saying for us to shave then the, the IFB, that's what you're saying, because we're not gonna have time to, to do what we need to do. Is that, is that what you're saying right now? Because again, we already submitted to you what it is that we need assistance with. And so, so you're saying that that's not gonna get accomplished. And so now we need to shave and now we have to go meet again, we'll have a subcommittee, waste time again, right? come up with a whole new set of shaved priorities so that then that can be, you know, that, that's troubling. That's very problematic because again, we're not being able to complete our full charge. So is that what you're saying, Mr. Bachelman? No. What are you saying? What, what are you saying? If we are looking towards getting a conclusion of the, of the report B, I think that you know, there. I think the charges. What what is in the IFB, which we will make into an RFP, is is very large, and I think that you know it's going to be a large consulting contract, very large consulting, and it and it, it won't. I don't think anybody will be able to accomplish this, and that's why well, in the time that you're setting us up to to do. Right. Like, well, that was my know? question. Like the request from the 
from the committee is November one, right? And so, you know, if if at some point this is a working group, the work has to be completed and handed off to the success, whatever the group is that's going to be doing this on a regular basis. You want to be able to empower that group, whoever is c coming in, to be able to own the project as well. So. I get it, but uh, then, I mean, I wasn't at the last meeting. I know November 1st deadline, I guess, was thrown out there. That That's the deadline? Can it be longer then? I actually am not sure we got a, conf a confirmation that we yeah. were going to be able to extend to November 1st. As of right now, our deadline is still the same. Uh, we just had a more in-depth conversation about the possibility of an extension at our last meeting, but I don't think it was ever actually confirmed. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones? I do think it's possible that the IFB document that we wrote would result in prohibitively expensive bids. Uh, and if, you know, if what we get is, you know, more than, you know, is likely to get approved, uh, it doesn't actually move us forward. So if, if the town manager could make a commitment to us about, um, you know, extending us, and we can talk about how long, I think November 1st was, I mean, November, November 1st was, was actually a date that Mr. Bachman threw out. But uh, I think if he could agree to extend us, agree that there will be a successor group and agree to put out an RFP, I think a few of us could agree to meet with him or and with Anthony or whoever to see how this thing could be shaped, not to, not to cut out any of the issues, but to define it in a way that it was manageable enough that uh, some good people would bid on it and at a price that you know, would be reasonable for the town. Ms. Owen? Mr. Bockelman, what's the rush to dissolving our group? I know we're a working group and we have to end, but what is the rush? Well, it was anticipated that it would be a short-term working group and that's how it was set up. And that's um, what the expectation is on, on, on my part. And, you know, I think that because of uh, the pandemic and all the other things that came into play and that, that the charge was much larger than anticipated. Uh, this was never anticipated to be a standing committee. It wasn't set up or recruited or advertised for that. And when I talked about it with the town council, um, so it was really defined to be a targeted study group that would then come out with with concrete recommendations. And I, I, you know, I feel like, you know, there were some extenuating circumstances. And moving the, to the next phase of implementation is really important um, in terms of what is the structural change, what is the, what's the structures that we're gonna put in place um, to make sure and, and you know, so. Uh, Ms. Pat and then Ms. Ferreira. So this is why it's very, very important that we have more BIPOC people to sit at the table in terms of making decisions that affect us. We're sitting here talking about the um, RFP going to be very expensive, but we don't talk about spending one point something million dollars fixing uh, the front of the town hall. So that actually irritates me. I don't even want to hear about it's going to be costly to do something that will benefit people who have been marginalized, oppressed, living in fear, in this town, I don't even want to hear about how much it's going to cost. I want us to do a good job. Amos is well resourced financially. When it comes to BIPOC stuff, that's when we don't have money. But we have money for dog pack. I'm repeating myself. We have $100,000 to hire a manager to manage capital projects. Should I continue with the list? And we're talking, you know, the cost to complete work that will keep BIPOC folks in this town and marginalized people safe. Excuse me. I don't want to hear that.
Um, thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Ellen. Yeah, so, so Mr. Bachman, we keep on, you know, and I know I'm, you know, and I've said this before, you know, keep on sounding like a broken record here. Uh, and Ms. Owen posed the question, which we had already posed, you know, like two weeks ago, and I'm sure last week too, in terms of there, I, I know that you all had a, a, a certain conception in your mind, right? In terms of what you wanted to happen. Even though, like I said, though, the charge that you all created was in response to everything that was happening in the country, the uprising that occurred after George Floyd and all the other people of color, especially black people were killed. And so you are under a lot of pressure and you all created a charge for us to deal with. But I guess in your mind and maybe others' mind, it was just to deal with a certain sc scope, right? The CREST program, a community responder, create a community responder, create an oversight board. But no, that's not all of the things. You put a charge that would make, that would ensure that people felt safe. Mm -hmm. So now you've seen that we collected data, we've talked to the BIPOC community. These are community members in Amherst that as Ms. Pat said, feel marginalized and feel intimidated and feel uh, persecuted and, and oppressed who are basically saying that, you know, our work needs to continue until it is done thoroughly. So you've heard that, the town councils have heard that, but you're still balking at it, right? And you're still going back to, no, it's about me and it's about what I want. You're the town manager, you know? And the town council is here to serve all of us, mm -hmm. to serve all of the residents. So basically what you're doing is you're denying the voices of the BIPOC residents. Yeah. I, I mean, let's just sit with that, Mr. Bachman. You're the town manager, right? Town. That encompasses everyone in the in the town, right? And the town and a portion of your town is saying that they want us to complete this work thoroughly and to completion, full completion. That means we'll need more time. And that means we'll need consultants. And you respond back to me. I do want that to be clear that no, that's not what you want. You conceptualize this as a terminal group working group and you want us to end at the time that you want us to end. Do you see, do you, do you hear what you're, you're saying? You're denying your residents. So that means, right, when it comes time for elections, appointments and everything else, we're gonna to have to then, you know, make sure that someone else that hears the BIPOC community is there to serve all residents and that the town councilors too, who are there to serve all residents will be the ones that will be elected in the town council. I mean, that's what I want you to respond to, if you could please. Are you listening to what we're saying and that it is from a BIPOC residents of Amherst? Can yeah. you please respond? Yes, I, I hear, and I think we, I think you're right, Ms. Ferrer, that we have gone sort of round and round on this and I, um, you know, my role as town manager is, um, you know, in responding to the council that hires me to do a job and to do it in the, to the best of my judgment and ability within the constraints that I have. I have constraints as well, budgetary constraints and, and other things. So that's the factor. The, and also being able to, if there is a recommendation or something that it gets implemented successfully. We don't wanna have a series of recommendations just to have a series of recommendations. That's why I believe really strongly that the CREST program to be successful has to have police and fire engaged in the establishment of it. Cause I think that is the surest path to success for the third stool, the third leg of the stool of, of, safe, of safety response. Um, I think we have that. I think that's moving forward. That's really a positive thing. Um, I think that the, um, you know, the, you know, I think as, as you said, said that the resident oversight board is an important tool for the town so that people who are unheard and are, uh, can somehow, and I, I, this is a complicated one. How do people confidentially go to a, a resident oversight, a public board and able and convey their concerns of, um, over policing or whatever. Um, so, and then, you know, my goals that are set by the council is to get things set up and running. And, um, and I think that the, you know, continuing to expand the mission is not getting us to um, 
accomplishments. And I, what I am asking the community safety working group to do is to focus on the things that we can accomplish and set up the next body that's going to go on, continue the work. There's the work is endless. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg. And so I think the most powerful thing that community safety working group can do is to pick a few things that are the most urgent and most um, impactful. And I think you've done that and say, let's dig in on these things. Let's get these changes made. And then, and, and but to say, and, I, and I, my fear is that we will be going down, you know, policy rabbit holes. Then you get into the legal stuff and the union stuff, and it's going to be endless. And it's not where I think the function, the functionality of this group will be best served. I think that's for the successor group or the resident oversight group, whoever, who's going to have a long-term established relationship with the police and who can build up their, their school skill set. And maybe some of you are, would be willing to serve on that group as well. Um, because you did, you have developed a really strong um, uh, basis of information on things. So that's how I look at it, Ms. Ferreira. And, um, and I'm, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm, re I'm hearing the things that you're saying, but I think we're just at in different locations in terms of where, what I can, what I feel I can do in my role as town manager. Um, thank you, Ms. Fur and Mr. Bachelman. Um, and I would like to call on Ms. Moisson and, and then Ms. Owen, but I would like to just make a brief comment because I wanted to thank Ms. Ferreira for that comment. Um, because I think like, I'll, and, and Ms. Ms. Ananabaku, because she did bring this up earlier, that we're really missing the goal of our group um, was to, we really needed to interact and provide um, a platform for the marginalized BIPOC community in Amherst so that their voices can be heard because the reason that there is mistrust with between that population and the APD as well as with all town officials is this exact reason right here. This is a perfect living example. They come and say what they need and nothing happens. And so you guys like you guys as in t town officials, I have heard many times, why don't they trust us? Why aren't they gonna come and speak at forums? Why? Because this is what happens. They tell you very clear, clear as day, what exactly they need. And then they are met with all of the reasons why that cannot happen. Not, these are the accommodations we are going to make so that we can do this for you. And I think that is the change that needs to happen here. Not, we're gonna meet you with all of the barriers that exist, but we're gonna figure out together how we can get over these barriers to make this happen because you deserve safety. That is like a basic human need. And so like, I agree with Ms. Pat in terms of like, we have money for everything else that we're talking about people's safety here. And I think that's also getting a little bit lost that that's a, that's a basic human need. Like they need that people deserve safety on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is important, essential, and urgent. And so I just really caution you, Mr. Bachelman, because you are talking about your, your investment in making these changes and making this happen quickly because you want substantive change, but you are not going to be able to, to meet your goal here because you're going to be off-putting the community. The community is not going to want to continue mm -hmm. engage, to engage. They are not going to trust you. They are not going to trust the Crest team. They're not going to trust the implementation. They're not going to trust the resident oversight board because of this that's happening right here. We, we, are, we have already gained some of the trust, not even of all of the BIPOC community, but some, and they are telling us this is what they need. And if we can't accomplish that for them, then what are they to expect to come from another group and another this and another forum and another, they are not to expect anything to come of those things. So we need to figure out a different way. Doing the same thing over and over again has not worked. It is not working. So what are we going to do differently, Mr. Bachelman? Not, well, this is the barrier and, and that's, and leave it at that. Like, what can we do to get over those barriers? What accommodations can we make? What different routes can, can be made? And I think for us to be able to be successful we need this to be a co-effort. Like we need you to work with us. 
not against us, not bumping up against us, not just sitting there passively. Mm -hmm. I think this needs to be a collective group for group effort. And we all need to be engaging in this together for it to be successful. And so it's a little bit hard because like we're throwing out suggestions and you're just like, well, I just didn't think, and that's fine. But then, so what are your suggestions? What are the other things we can do? What alternatives, what hurdles can we jump through here? Because that's what's going to need to happen for this to be successful. <coughs> Um, and sorry, and then I no. think I called on Ms. Morrison and then Ms. Owen, and I also see you, Ms. Bowman, with your hand up. Thank you for patiently waiting. Um, so I know that we've struggled and we've gone around and around with this for a while, right? And so, in fact, regardless with or without a consultant, it, there's work to be done and we can't get it done until we get past this point. So I, I am just curious to know, like, how much time does CSWG think that they need to fulfill whatever it is with or without a consultant? And then how long does it take for the RFP to go through? And by the time you can have someone handled, because, I mean, uh, hired, because you, what you don't want is extend out three months, but it takes two months to get the RFP contract signed. So I'm just trying to find, like to see if we can come to some happy medium somewhere and, and keep moving forward. Cause we are definitely at a place and it, it just seems like it, there's a way to, to solve everything, right? So do, does CSWG members have any idea to how much time that they think that they would need to complete this charge? Miss um, Owen, and then I would like to also make a comment. Thank you. I think it has to be dependent on um, how long the consultant process is going to take and how long we're going to work with them. I think that I, I don't have much experience with RFPs and consultants, but I think we could go from there based if other group members have experience with that and want to chime in. And also, I just want to say, I think that our group should be extended until Cress is out just because the community helped develop this program and we need to be together to have to build that community trust around the program and to continue having dialogue with people who are silenced. Um, thank you, Ms. Owen. And just to add to that, so I also agree with Brianna, but I believe that there are actually a number of things to take into consideration before we can answer that question, because one, we also want whatever the successor group may be to be in place. Like we don't want there to be a gap. Um, so I think that that needs to happen as well. Um, and then just, just going back to the community engagement, I think, so we are aware and we know that we are not a longstanding group. And I don't think that that's what we're asking for to happen at this time. Um, and so I, I think we do realize that at some point we will have to be dismantled, but we're not done with our charge. That's the first part of it. And then the second part is that we have heard the feedback from the community and we, we, the intention is for us to allow the community engagement to, to guide our work. Right. And so the feedback we're getting from the community and specifically a meeting that Brianna and ha um, Brianna had very recently is that how are we, how are you guys going to build trust between the community and the Crest team, if your group is dismantled and we communicated all of these things through your group and you are the group that sort of is representative to the community as the people who came up with this, as the people who fostered this idea and who brought our, our visions and our voices to the people who are implementing this program. And we've been acting like a bridge this entire time. So the feedback we have gotten from the community, like this is not an ask we're coming up with ourselves, is that they would like us to be in place until the implementation of the Crest team because that's how they feel like they will be able to build trust within the community. So like we are using the voices within the community to inform our work and that's just another need that we have heard. So I don't know if that's, I know Ms. Winston, that's not a, an exact answer to your question, um, but oh, just but that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can shape, oh, go ahead. Sorry, because no, there's sorry. an echo. There are just contingencies. Like there are things I think that would, we would also need to know the answer to, to pick a specific date. Well, right. I mean, I think it's kind of hard to say we're going to start Crest on this day because I, I I, I think that might be a little bit harder, right? Because we can't control who we're going to be able to hire and not hire necessarily, or who will apply, basically, is what I'm going to say. But maybe if we look at it in the timeline frame instead of an RF, I'm just trying to make it so that we can move that we can move forward. And so if we look at it as a timeline, including all of that information, maybe that can help guide us a little bit better. Right now, we're just completely stuck at this one point and I, you know, and there has to be some way to get past that, right? Without us, uh, you know, and so I'm just trying to figure out one of the thing is time. So I'm trying to figure out how much time do we think we need to make that happen? And then I don't know, you can't, I'm, I would be a little bit hesitant to say 
that the crest would start on November 1st, right? Like, I feel like, I don't know. I don't know how other people feel about that either, but. Thank you, Ms. Moisten. Um, Ms. Pat and then Ms. Owen. So my thinking is at least for us to be on for, for a year, like from, we started this in December last year. I would like to request to be one year anniversary of 2021 and it wouldn't stop setting up the oversight board. It wouldn't stop, you know, to start uh, recruiting, you know, responders or DEI director as we continue to do our work. Many things can be happening at the same time. I don't see any issue with that. So I would like to see that our group work for one year. Wait, Thank one you. more year or the- No, 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 no. Does that, uh, December 2021. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Owen? I'm um, looking at the timeline that Mary Beth sent Alicia and I um, right before this meeting. And the timeline that she sent us says that Cress is going to start operating in March. So I think it's important that we stay together until March, because also I think another thing the CSWG has done is engaged a conversation between social service agencies in Amherst. And I think that we're going to have to have another forum to see how we can, again, bridge that community trust in the CREST program, working with key players who serve um, people in Amherst like Lev from the Survival Center and talk about how we can get the word out about CREST. So I think March would be a better date. Um, thank you, Ms. Ellen. And sorry, Ms. Bowman, I think I missed you earlier and I never doubled back to you. Did you have something that you wanted to say? No, okay, sorry, thank you. <clears throat> Um, and so I don't, sorry, Ms. Ferreira, is that a hand? No, it's, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I'm thinking that I could live with Ms. Pat's date for our work on our charge. If on that date, we became a CRESS advisory committee that then saw the CRESS program through into its first half year of implementation or something like that. But I wanted to also ask another question. Mr. Bachman, is there a way to hire someone at a set hourly rate who would do some number of hours of research and consultation for us rather than specifying you know, specifying these jobs and how to complete them. I mean, everybody's going to bid high because it looks, it looks like a lot of work. But if we had a top-notch researcher, uh, hopefully a BIPOC person who's got some experience, uh, and we had a set number of hours that we could identify what we most needed them to do, uh, and we did the things we could do, uh, there might be a way to, to do this for... I mean, we, we could know ahead of time how much money it would cost. And I think we could probably get the job done. It's a clarifying question. Yes, Mr. Bachman. So, so what you're thinking, is, uh, it's an interesting idea and I, and I appreciate all the comments on this. And I um, just, just for framework, the uh, town council has uh, voted to instruct me to have Crest up and running by February one, I mean, or have the I think to have them started hired by February one. I think that was the vote that they took, with the anticipation that, um, and and that's the date we've been targeting uh, for the Crest program for impl and that I mean I think they get hired and then they have to do the training that would have to happen. Um, so as we back up from that, we were starting to put together a timeline in terms of when do we have to if in order to hire by have them on board by February one. How when do we have to advertise and do the interviewing, which goes back to like basically November one. In order to get there, we have to hire someone who's gonna be the community, who's gonna oversee the program, which which is another couple months. I mean, Jen would know better than I, how long it, it takes a couple months probably to recruit someone. So we're, there's some urgency in terms of just hiring the people because we wanna hire the person in charge to, who will help guide the hiring of the next group. Um, and Mr. Vernon Jones, your um, idea is interesting. I, need to process that a little bit are you i guess a clarifying question is are you thinking of um uh 
like if we suppose I'll just say the leap program just because they have experience and we've talked about them previously in this. I don't want to prejudice prejudice anybody in this situation, but if you said, "Hey, we want to buy X number of hours from the leap program consulting group or or a particular person, who however you, you decide to do it," um, and let's start with let's start let's do that right away and start work and see how far we get the issue. I have talked to procurement. I think that's a possibility um, that it takes it out of the RFP process. It begins a different kind of contract under certain, if it's under a certain amount of money, I'm not sure exactly what that sum is, um, but it, it does expedite. It might be able to expedite things if, if, if speed is of the essence or not speed, but just wanting to get the, the yeah. as you start to do your work, you want to have information from people and there's going to be lots of questions that pop up as you are doing the research you're doing right now. Um, it's an interesting yeah, I mean, idea. my thought is that it's some, I mean, we could not, we could specify some questions we have about any one of these pieces right now yeah, yeah. and somebody could get started on them. But what our next questions are is really partly dependent on what the answers are yeah, yeah. and partly dependent on what we've been able to do and partly dependent on what we hear from the community and the police and, and everybody else. Um, and it's, it's a cleaner arrangement with whoever's doing it because they're not going to have to guess about what's mm -hmm. going to be enough. Right. Um, I mean, it's a, it, it, just in response, to that, I think one of the first questions is how much time do we have to do the work? Once you set up your work, they want to know because if it's, if it's a smaller piece of time, they need to see if they, some firms won't, and we've run into this with other things, they're just already got contracts in place. They're not going to be able to take it on. Um, if you're looking for a farther down the road, they can do it. But I think that's an interesting idea. Ms. Pat. So, uh, Mr. Ross, thank you for your suggestion. I have a mixed feeling about, you know, your suggestion. I, you know, I get the point that it might make, you know, the process faster for the town manager to hire a researcher. My concern is I kind of like the bidding process where subgroup of CSWG is able to interview, you know, the folks and we kind of discuss and decide whether or not we want to go with somebody and also to have people who are local do the work with us who are impacted by this um, by police would be nice to you know to just get people that are not from this area to do the work. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I know that leap is being thrown around, and I'm sure there's a lot of work they can do. But for the charge that we have, I rather have people who are local who are impacted by police. You know. Um, for them to do the work for us. If we want to call them researchers, we can change, you know, the name of what it is. But if we can get them locally and they're people of color, BIPOC, I'll be okay with that. But then mm -hmm. how, how do you go about the process? You know, do you advertise? You know, this is public fund, you know, money. So I'm sure the town manager knows, you know, we, you know, he can just, you know, approach somebody and said, you know, I want you to research this on, you know, it's public money, tax, taxpayers money it has to be, you know, advertised somehow. Um, I thought Ms. Bowman had her, her hand up before. Yeah, I, I went back to her and I think she said she didn't want to make a comment at this time, but Ms. Bowman, if you would like to speak, um, please feel free to either unmute or just put your hand back up and I will call on you again. I'm here. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Um, sorry, I saw other hands, but everyone put their hand down, so now I I'm, I'm, look. <clears throat> I'm, I've said this already once before, and I'm gonna keep saying it. Um, anytime BIPOC people ask for anything, we get the runaround. Um, and it's exhausting. It really, truly is exhausting. And 
I've said this directly to you before, Mr. Bachman, that your community needs to feel uncomfortable. Because you know what? The system that was set up to put us in the position that we are in, the, 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 what we're operating in right now was not comfortable for BIPOC people. And what I see you doing constantly is tiptoeing around your community because you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Like literally, literally saying to them, this is uncomfortable for you. I hear that. You need to be hearing that, that, we're, that this is uncomfortable for you, my fellow white people. But if we're going to actually see some real change, there's going to be time of being uncomfortable. Because you know what? These people over here, these BIPOC people over here have been dealing with uncomfortable their entire existence. But you won't do that. And so honestly, I, I like, I just like, I, I, I know that like in the last few meetings, I haven't said much. And it's because I really like, I really am like at a point where I'm kind of washing my hands of the situation. And it's not because I don't care. It's because as usual, BIPOC community will have to stick together with BIPOC community and take care of each other and be there for each other and be there for each other's kids and be there for each other as a community because the white people in this community do not care. And you can say all you wanna say, you can put as many, like I said, Black Lives Matter signs up as you wanna put up, but your actions are exactly what tells us what you will and will, won't do. Every time somebody says, okay, I'm gonna put it to you in this way. A few months ago, I sprained my ankle really, really, really bad, right? <clears throat> and it hurt. And I told my job, I said, look, my ankle really hurt. I need to have some downtime. I need to be able to sit down at work. I need to be able to like not put pressure on it. I need to be able to ice it and elevate it. Like if you want me to come in, this is what I'm going to need to do. Now my job could have, could have done one, like they could have done a couple different things. One, they could have just said, go home until you feel better. They could have been like, we will accommodate you as much as we can you know, and like, and hopefully that'll be enough. And if not, then obviously you can go home or they could be like, get up, get on your feet and do your job. What you are telling BIPOC community is get up and get on your feet, regardless of the pain that we're going through, regardless of the struggles that we are dealing with at the hands of white people in this community, you are telling us to get up and keep going. Now, I'm not saying that I can't get up and keep going because you know what? Been there, done that. Because at the end of the day, that's how I was taught by my mom who was concerned about my well-being in this white community. But do not sit there. Do not sit there and try to be like a martyr. Do not sit there and try to act like you're helping. Do not sit there and try to act like you're listening when you're clearly not. None of us are speaking another language. None of us are speaking in a, in a dialect that you do not understand. We are being very clear and we are being very direct with the needs of this community. And you are not, you are, you are choosing to break it apart to make it comfortable. You need to feel no comfort in this. This is not a comfortable situation. It is not a comfortable situation for me when I get behind the wheel in the town that I've been living in for 30 years and I still break a sweat when I have to drive by a police officer in Amherst and I've never done anything to, to even consider, like that would be even considered like, oh yeah, oh maybe she robbed a bank or oh yeah, maybe she did this back in the day. Oh maybe, I, I, my mother never let me go anywhere. So I never did anything. I literally didn't do anything. I didn't party, I didn't do anything. But the fear is passed down through generations of harassment, through generations of torment for at the hands of police officers. It doesn't matter if you've never felt it. It doesn't matter if your neighbor has never felt it. It doesn't matter if the rest of, if every white person in this community has never felt it. I felt it. I am in a constant state of heightened awareness. I don't calm down. Like I don't get that moment where I get to calm down. 
because I'm constantly be at fear for my son's safety. I am raising black boys. They, I am constantly in fear of their safety. I'm constantly in fear of my goddaughters and their emotional and physical safety when it comes to Amherst police. One of my, one of my most significant conversations over this pandemic was with a, with a teacher who had a six-year-old daughter, I believe it was a daughter, a six-year-old child. And we were talking about how black folks from the moment that they lay eyes on their child, it like, even, I would even say through pregnancy, it is, you know what, I will say through pregnancy because you know what, black babies and black moms are dying at a four times higher than white moms and babies. So yes, I will say in utero, we are already teaching our kids to be fearful of certain people in the certain situations because that is all we know. Because that is all the systemic racism of these communities has taught us. They have taught us that we are not safe. So when I talk to this parent who is also an administrator, who is a teacher at the school, and I was like, look, I had to teach my boys from very early on about racism and about systemic racism, about you know what they can and can't do in public and what you know how they can and can't look, behave, act, whatever the case may be. And that people weren't gonna like them just solely based on the color of their skin. And this parent said to me, well, you know, they're a little young, they're only six, so you know. We haven't talked to them about it. And I said, well, that's nice. That shows your white privilege. I don't have that option. You need to look at this situation as you don't have that option. You don't have that option. You don't have the option to like, you have to look at it and being like, I need to hold this community accountable. It is not my job as a black woman to hold the white community ac accountable. It is the white com other white members of the community to hold each other accountable for their behaviors and for their neglect on, on basic human rights. Like we don't feel safe. How much clearer can we make it? We don't feel safe. This is what we need in order to feel safe. And instead you're trying to pull the rug under, oh, because that's not what I planned. So what? So what it's not what you planned? That doesn't, plans get changed all the time. Right now, you have a community of people who feel safe with us. And you're telling them they're going to have to build up another community to feel safe with. One, that's not fair to them. They've already established trust with us. Two, this is what y'all do. And, and, and you can go back and you can look at the history of BIPOC people asking for help or asking for things to change in this community. And you will see, what was it? 17 different things that things that were started to, to address BIPOC people's issues in this community, if not more, since the 90s. That's just going back to the 90s. Mr. Buckman, get it together, man. Get it together. Because right now you're just you're just blowing a lot of hot air. Really. You really, really are. And and I just I just I it's just it's 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 disappointing. And frankly, it's disgusting. It's just upholding the standards of systemic racism. That's exactly what it is. Get it together. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, so in light of the time, I just wanted to pose one last question and then hopefully move on to the next item just because I feel as though we still haven't gotten an answer to our question. And so to just post, to pose the question in the most simplest form that I can, what is the status of our request for an extension? Is it a firm yes, firm no, or still have not decided? So, in order to understand, are we still on, I need to understand where the scope, what you're expecting to accomplish. I think that um, 
you know, if, if, so again, it's there, it's inter, interrelated with the um, consulting person or group, whatever we do on that, right? Um, I'm sorry, those are two separate things. Well, I think that they're, they're sort of combined. So if we go to the consulting group, you definitely need a um, extension. That's what I would say, right? Yes. Um, if we don't cons go with the consulting group and I think, you know, the, so, you know, on Monday's meeting, I think the council did um, recommend that you're, you be extended. I'm not sure if you watched that part of the meeting or not. Um, so, um, but they were not expecting any more consulting services to be provided from their statements. Those are individual statements. Um, so, so I think the extension can happen with a consulting group or not. The consult, the extension has to happen if there's a consulting group. Um, and so if there's no consulting group, there's a possibility of getting, I, I don't see how you get your work done by September 1, quite honestly. I mean, just the, if, even if it's just on the scope that we've already identified in terms of those four major things, um, that's, those are all pretty hefty things. Um, so yeah, I think um, extending it to, to November 1 is, is doable, it will be done and I'll adjust the uh, charge to do that. Thank you, Mr. Bachelman. Um, okay, so I would like to, Ms. Ferreira. Oh, that's the absolute latest. That was what the recommendation, I thought that was what the recommendation was and that's, yeah, that's. I thought that that's the, that's the date you threw out. I thought that others have said, you know, December, um, yeah, December, and then others have said, you know, yes, yeah, December, but then we become an advisory group to see the crest put through. Right. Yeah. So the, I, I want you to, to respond to all of that, not just put out the, the November 1st. I think November 1st was just a date thrown out there. So, you know, December, you know, 31st, and then we become an advisory group. Yeah, so let's start with the November 1st and see where we go, see how much we can get done by November 1st. Okay, so you're saying November 1st and then we can ask for another extension if no, I th the work is not done by then? I think the working group ought to be closing, finishing up its work and, and handing it off, getting the next successor groups moving. Um, and yeah, I think you think- So why are we getting... here? Why are we here? You gave us a task to complete we're trying to get it complete in a thorough way. And you're saying, well, no, it's, you know, it's not convenient that it's still going on in this, this way because you feel like it's non-thorough. The thing is, at the end of the day, you, by, by you saying you're dismantling us, unless you have intent that you are not telling us, which that's just a whole nother issue, to, you know, have us be part of something else, but that's still that's still backhanded and sneaky, as far as I'm concerned. Whether or not you that was your intent, like it's still backhanded and sneaky. Right now, all you're doing is exactly what I just said you're doing. So for me, I'm done with this meeting. There's nothing else I want to hear about this meeting because, Mr. Bachelman, you are holding that status quo. You are holding on to it, and you are holding on to it tight. And I see you. Like I see you. I'm just it's. I don't even know why you put us together. It's some joke. It's some joke amongst the, like, you know, the elite white of, of, of Amherst. You know what I'm saying? And then don't even get me started, like, because I do under, if, I, I believe I'm correct in saying that you don't even live in this community. So at no point do I feel like your intent has anything to do with this community because you don't live here. You don't interact with the BIPOC community in this community, in this, in this area. You don't see what we go through and you're clearly not hearing what we go through. You're clearly not hearing what the community is telling us as, a, as, as people who are, they're looking at as people they can reach out to and get a message across. I, <laughs> this, is, this, is all, this is a whole joke. This is all performative to me as far as I'm concerned. It's a whole bunch of performative and I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm tired of being in a place where I'm just being looked at as like, oh, you know, 
you know, we'll get to Sheena there because she's going to be, you know, she'll say what she has to say. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's performative. It's performative. And I don't, I don't like it. And I don't like backhanded motions and I don't like backhanded behavior because it's a waste of my time. Do you understand? I'm a mother of seven kids. You understand the amount of time and amount of energy that I have to do, I have to do to get together at these meetings, to be here, to be kicking kids out of rooms so they're not constantly in my face the whole meeting? Shame on you. There's no, there's, there's, I don't know what your intent was behind this, but I'm right now, I'm really disgusted. I really am. And I want the community to know because I feel like I just wasted so much of my time sharing ideas, sharing thoughts that I thought might make a difference because of who was part of this group. But at the end of the day, look who's making the decisions. Look who's making the decisions. Look who's keeping us from making this happen. And look who's telling us, well, you can't do it your way, but maybe this way will be acceptable. Here's a little bit of crumbs. You should be happy with that. It's the white community of Amherst. The people on the board, the people that don't interact with people who look like me, the people who don't interact with people. They don't inter they don't even interact with, with with people who have mental health. They don't that are living on the streets. They don't interact with people who are, are part of the bike pop community, struggling single moms, whatever, whatever. They don't inter they make sure they don't. They make sure they don't from when they do their meeting. They make sure they don't from how much they give for pay to come to these things and do this and for the amount of work that we put in, the amount of work that we put in. And I still took it because I was like, oh, this is, this is for the, this is for a good thing. This is for a good thing. This might actually make some change. And at the end of the day, it's the same old story, same story. We say what we need. We say what we, what will make things better, that will make change, in, that will make us more trusting change in our communities as, uh, as BIPOC members and say like, this is what will help us have, start to have some more trust and more trust and so on and so forth. And then all the white people that decide, make the decisions, shut it down. And you might not think you're shutting it down because you might think you're giving us a cracker over there and a cracker over there, but let me tell you something. You're shutting it down because you're not hearing what we're saying. You're not hearing what the community is saying. And you're still feeling dignified and well justified in what you're saying to us. This is what's best. This is what's best. And that's not what's best. I know what's best for me. You don't know what's best for me. I know what's best. You can give suggestions. But at the end of the day, what I need is what's important. Not what you feel comfortable with. Because what I need is to know that I can send my kids out the door and they're not going to get harassed by Amherst PD. I need to know that I can have friends who can have parties and they're not going to get harassed and disrespected by Amherst PD. Knowing damn well the college students that are down the street are breaking, literally busting up houses. You're not hearing us. You're not listening and you're making that decision consciously at this point because you've been called on it a number of times. So yes, Mr. Bachman, I see you and you are performative and you are full of it and I don't like it. And I don't know why you wasted our time. And if you wanna answer a question, that's what I wanna know. Why are you wasting our time? Um, thank you, Ms. Bowman. And um, Ms. Owen, I'm going to allow you time to speak, but I just wanted to to, um, to go back very briefly to Ms. Ferreira's question um, <clears throat> to just specify that. So there was a, a town council meeting this Monday that just passed. And at the council meeting, I, I also really suggest if everyone has time to, to find time to watch at least the part of the meeting pertaining to the CSWG and the motion that was recommended. And so there was a motion put forward to recommend an extension for the work of the CSWG until November 1st. And that motion did pass um, 10 yes to abstained one no, I believe. 
Um, so that's where that number, that's where that date is coming from. So the town council has passed a motion recommending that the town manager extend us into that date. Um, the reason why I am suggesting that everyone watch the meeting, because I think the conversation around the extension and around our need for a consulting group will really help to make everyone understand what is happening here and what's happening right now. And I think it also, I mean, I don't know for sure, Mr. Bockelman, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking incorrectly for you, but I think a lot of what Mr. Bockelman is saying to us um, are things that I also heard expressed during the council meeting. And so like these concerns and these thoughts that he is sharing with us are also shared by other town councilors and their thought that we don't need a consultant group and that that would be a waste of money but that they did, however, recommend to give us an extension on our work. So I would really highly suggest if you guys have time to go back to the recording of Monday night's town council meeting, because you will find a lot of answers to the questions that are being posed here tonight. Um, and I would like to also give Ms. Owen a, a chance to speak and then Ms. Pai, I do see you also. I can go after Ms. Pat. I had a question that's on a different topic. Um, thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Just want to remind us it's to eight and we have other items to discuss. One suggestion I would like to make is perhaps we should, maybe the two co-chairs can write a letter to the town council for the need to, for us to get help with our project. And I empathize with um, Mr. Bachman, you know, as an employee, you have to listen to your bosses and in this case, the you know, the town council, you have to meet their deadline, their goals and everything. And I know you're, you're juggling a lot, but I think your role is also to take information you get from us to your boss and say, you know, this is what I'm hearing. And when I put out the charge for, for the group, um, I didn't realize that it would take this much. You know, that, you know, you should advocate on our behalf and say, we really, really need help. You know, I kind of like the idea of researcher, as long as it's local, it's people of color, it doesn't have to be one researcher. It can be a couple to speed up the whole thing and, you know, advertise it. Um, I hear you because I'm an employer. I, I get the professional aspect of where you're coming from. And I know your heart is in a good place. And I know you're trying, but you know, I also know that you're learning a lot from us. Um, please take whatever all of us have said tonight, uh, you know, as a learning process for you, because we're deeply, really hurting, and what we're expressing is, you know, what we feel all the time. So, to be honest with you tonight, I'm tired. Like I can't even absorb anymore. I'm so exhausted. This meeting has been very intense. So. If we can just be mindful of our time, you know, when we speak, so that we can wrap this up tonight. I'm tired. <laughs> yes, thank you, Miss Pat. Um, Miss Ferrer, and then sorry, I think I, I skipped Miss Owen as well. It's yeah, okay. I mean, and and I'm being mindful too because, mind you, remember, I'm in I'm in West Africa, Cape Verde. So as, as soon as I can be out of this meeting, I want to be off. What uh, time is it over there? It is uh, almost eleven at night. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Is There's that time that? difference. Yeah. All of that. Um, yeah, it's only because we're in West Africa. If you go to South Africa, then it's a lot more. Yeah, because I've been to South Africa too. But yeah. anyway, so um, so my question, just to be mindful of the time though, is back to what I had asked uh, previously, uh, Mr. Bachman, and you've heard of Ms. Bowman and everyone else. So you're saying November 1st, I hear you that, that I guess, thank you, Ms. Walker, for giving me more information because obviously I, I, I didn't attend the, the meeting that November 1st was what the town council extended it to. However, again, we're saying we've given you all this information. So November 1st, and then if there's more time, we can extend the time beyond that. Not agreeing to that, no. So you're not agreeing to that. So basically you're just agreeing to November 1st is the extension, and that's that. That's where we, we end off. Yes. Okay, so then we can go back, though, to the town council 
and ask for more of an extension after that. That's what you're saying for us to do then, right? Well, the, it's, a, it's a charge that I wrote. It's not a charge the council wrote. It's an advisory group to the town manager. Yeah, if, they, if they had written the charge, they would own it, yes. Yeah, but but you but basically you were did not want to budget from September first, but then they are your bosses as you've stated, and then they've told you November first, and now you've had to go to November first, right? Not so, necessarily. Yeah, but you have though. I have. Okay. But more, okay. Yeah. November first, and then we'll we'll go from there. I just wanted clarity on that. Yes, thank you, Ms. Ferreira. And, and also just to provide a little bit more, if this is helpful, the, I think the town council, it's a recommendation. So they're recommending that the town manager extend us. So he doesn't even necessarily have to extend us until November 1st, but it is a recommendation that they did pass. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point that they can only pass recommendations in terms of um, that. Um, and then Ms. Moisson, I think you also had your hand up. I did, but I didn't know if Ms. Owen wanted to go first. Oh, I'm so sorry, Ms. Owen. Um, it's okay, uh, Ms. Ferreira and Ms. Pat said what I needed to say, so. Oh, well, um, so oh, with it, if the new date was November 1st, so I think like whether you, I think maybe you guys should try and figure out whether you wanna try and, or have Paul find out if you guys can hire a researcher. And I would suggest that, or if you need to go through the RFP, um, so that you guys can get moving. And Paul, how long does it typically take for an RFP to go through? I think it's a question Anthony would answer, um, but it's multiple weeks for sure. Okay, so a little need... bit longer than the IFB? Yeah. Okay. Because you have to write the, the description, then you have to give people time to respond to it. Then you have to evaluate the proposals. So it's different. So my thought was if you went with the researcher, that can be something that if it can happen, I don't know that it can happen that way or not, but if it is able to happen, then I would assume that we would go through the usual human resources channels and then perhaps, no. It, it'd probably be a contract, not a, not a per position. All right. Yeah. But either way, I think you guys might be able to sit on the hiring committee. I would hope so, somebody from the group. Right. Oh. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Ferreira. I guess that's the thing at this point, you know, I, I think Mr. Vernon Jones had said about, you know, if they could be just uh, um, a group of people uh, to work with, I guess, Anthony, to just come up with what's the best way for us to be able to get what we get with the, with the amount of work that we need to get done in the quickest way possible. Can we just do that so that we can move forward? So there's some limitations on dollar figures on that. I, I need would need I think ten thousand dollars is the limit on that when you can go that process. So I would need to double check with Anthony because there are various rules that come into play on procurement on these things. No, but yeah, but we would work with Anthony, right? Wouldn't the subcommittee work with Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk. Yes, obviously, I want to talk with Anthony and, and see what those rules are so you so we're not going down a path that isn't realistic for the for the working group um mr vernon jones i think you also had your hand up well i mean first i do think it's important if we're selecting somebody that one or more of the bipoc members of this group be on the hiring committee or the selection committee uh if that's part of the process mm -hmm. uh and can we get this set up so that you and our chairs and Anthony or some small group of us can meet even in the next few days. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Buckland. I think that was a question for um, for you directly. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, not tomorrow. So it's, then we have the fifth is a, is a holiday, of course, but next week, certainly. Um, uh, I think that that we could understand what the what the constraints are, certainly in the next couple of days. I mean, again, I, th I think the limit is is a uh, is uh, ten thousand dollars in terms of what we can go that route on. Um, but I would, I would just, I would, before I venture out too far on that, I would, I could trust his judgment on these things versus mine. And would it be a possibility, Mr. Bockelman, if we cannot have a meeting with him before next week's meeting, that we just invite him to next week's meeting? Yeah, I'm sure we'll, unless he's on vacation, I don't know, right. sure if he's on vacation next week, a lot of people are taking vacation, but I think if he's around, we can certainly meet, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday, that won't be an issue. Who, okay. who from this group would you want to have be part of that discussion? 
more like that. The co-chairs. I'm I'm available if that's what the group wants to do, but I, I I want to know if there's anybody else in the group who wanted to be in that meeting or wanted to be doing that. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. I'm, I'm willing. To, I'm willing to be a part of it as long as you know at least one of the co-chairs is there as well. I mean, the other, uh, the one we did before, it was sub, oh, I shouldn't use the word subgroup, never mind. <laughs> okay, two of you can do it because I'm interested also, but it depends on the time. Like I can't do certain days. So, so I, I, my understanding is this is just a, to understand where the, where are the different paths available to us if we were going to go, go the consulting route, right? That's, or, or specifically, is there a way to con have a contractor who works on a per, per hourly per diem basis to expedite the ability to get somebody on board? That's what I understand. Well, but, but also kind of showing him, Anthony, all what we have so far and then saying, okay, what would be the speediest way to get this accomplished? Mm -hmm. I mean, let me just say what is in my mind. I like continuity. I'm very happy with what Seven Gen did. Why, not, why can't you know, um, the town reach out to them and say, would they be interested in, you know, contracting hourly work? What is it? Then we come up with topics that we need most help with. If, you know, if the money is the issue, which, you know, irritates me, but I kind of like continuity because they are already involved with this. I'll be very comfortable for them to continue. I just want to speak my mind. I mean, it's going to take a while for me to, you know, to have a new person, I have to deal with trust issue, regardless of the color of the skin that person is. You know, because you're BIPOC doesn't mean that, you know, um, you agree with everything, you know, so. Bachman, what about that suggestion? Well, I think what we're looking, once we figure out what we're looking for, you want someone who has a, had experience working with police departments and doing reform efforts. I think you, we, the qualifications that you would put forward are, are very important. So you want somebody who's, who doesn't have to study everything, has already looked at hundreds of policies, hundreds of resident oversight boards, whatever it is that we're really focused on. I think you, the qualifications for the person uh, is really important. It, um, I mean, I would argue that knowledge of our town is less important than the, the subject area knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Balcom, and, and thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Just very quickly, I'm not sure if I'm even excited about the, the, the concept of researcher anymore. Of course, you know, whatever the majority says and whatever, you know, my mom used to say, whoever has the money, you know, holds the power. So um, if it's going to come down to this, if the goal is for us to complete our work, I'm not sure that I, you know, I'm buying into the whole thing. Um, so at least if we reach out to seven gen and they say they can't do it because they don't have expertise or they can't, or they have, you know, other resources other resources they can tap into to get the work done for us. And if they say they can't do it, then that's different. Then we move on to other people that um, somebody with in the police background to do the research for us. I don't know how I feel about that, actually. Um, thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Moisten? Uh, Tashina apologized for leaving the meeting, um, but she had to go, so. Thank you, Ms. Moisten. Um, thank you, Ms. Pat, for, for those suggestions. I'm wondering, though, if that's something that we have to decide or, or, or engage in further discussion right at this moment, or if this is something that we no. can think about, and then when we get more information from Mr. Yeah. Um, Delaney, that then we can come back to that to those suggestions? Yeah, I think is that suppose, okay? yeah, can we, whoever's going to be meeting with them, if it's you, Ms. Walker and Mr. Vernon Jones, if you all can kind of just pose all of that and share Ms. Pat's idea and kind of talk about all the different mm -hmm. options and then we can discuss that in the next meeting. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement, Ms. Freer. I think that that would be a good step. And so I, I'm willing to meet and I think that Brianna might be as well, but just because we've, we've been doing a lot of meetings, I think 
it's appropriate to give Mr. Vernon Jones and Miss Pat the ability to meet and that if the timing doesn't work for you, Miss Pat, or you, Mr. Vernon Jones, that then Brianna and I can step in. That sounds good. Just very quickly, just to say that we live in an you know, academic community and somebody with you know, background in teaching in college level that has done research, you know, will be able to help us with this work. We don't need anybody with, you know, police, you know, background to do it. I, I don't know if I will receive it. I've already made up my mind. I'll be very skeptical. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones. I just say my preference would be to have one of the co-chairs with us as well, if possible. Um, one or both. I'll step back. I don't, I don't need to be in the meeting. It's okay. Two of you can do it. It's fine. Um, I just need clarification from either Ms. Moisten or Mr. Balkelman. How many of us can meet together without it being considered um, a violation of the open meeting law? So your quorum is four. Um, and I withdraw. I withdraw. I'm and on, on, so the quorum is for, I would say, on a hesitant side, no more. Than, I, I think two, when you have two people, that's pretty good. I would say three might push it to where you might want to post a meeting, even though you don't necessarily have to. I, I withdraw. My, my schedule is quite full. It's okay. I'm, I'm just expressing my concerns. Yeah, yeah. Because anybody with teaching background in college level, has done research, you know, have, you know, track, you know, record of doing research should be able to handle this. Is what I'm saying. Um, so. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, so I, I mean, I would be happy to go with you, Mr. Vernon Jones. I'm not sure that the time and the date yet, but I have um, quite a bit of flexibility next week. So we're, we're hoping for Tuesday. Is that um, the, the, Mr. Balkelman, is that something you, as a question that you can propose to Mr. Delaney to see if he has availability on Tuesday? Is there like a specific time frame, Mr. Vernon Jones, that we might be able to propose? My preference would be between noon and five. And that is also okay with me. Mr. Balkelman, would you be able to reach out to Mr. Delaney to see if you can facilitate a meeting, or not facilitate, but um, organize a meeting for us on Tuesday between 12 and five? I think I'll shoot, I'll shoot for Tuesday at noon. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Do you guys want to be in person or via Zoom? I think that's... I'm fine either way. Yeah, I also don't have a preference. Well, we'll I'm, we'll, I'm available we'll, for both. So we'll all be in town hall. So you, you two should decide how you would like to do it. Whatever's more convenient for you both. Um, if he's available at 12, I would be open to doing an in-person meeting. I would too. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the, uh, well, so we, we didn't really stick to the, the agenda items for this week. And I think we briefly though, discussed some of the things. The next thing was the um, priorities for part two of the charge, the IFB phase two, the resident oversight board. Um, and then the last item was recommendations from part one of charge to follow up on. And so I'm wondering if there's agreement that at least see the recommendations from part one of the charge to follow up on that we can move to next meeting and that we don't have to continue into conversation around that at this time. Um, Ms. Pat? So be honest with you, I have not read it. I think it came through today. I mean, the, the document came through today. I apologize, which document? Uh, the recommendation for part, part one. There was a, a document that was coming through as we're op about to start the meeting or something like that. Okay, go ahead. Next so one. I sent out earlier today, I sent out the packet. Everything in the packet has been in previous packets over multiple times because we just keep so it there the only thing what was new was Irv's and then Brianna sent me stuff 
you know, right before the meeting. So I uploaded those okay. to the new packet. So oh, the first like those. six pages are, are is already stuff that you guys have seen. And then the last page is the response from Irv Rhodes and I believe a note of thanks or gratitude or for support for supporting the CSWG. I see. Has that gone out yet? The, the thank you letter? So uh, I don't believe so, Miss Owen. Has no, it ha no, it hasn't. That's the final project. I was hoping that um, we could agree on it tonight at this meeting, but it's honestly just two paragraphs thanking the community for their support, coming to public comment, um, emailing us and supporting our work overall. So if everyone's comfortable, I'm happy to send that to the Indy. Oh, and, and indeed, you know, deadline is tomorrow. I haven't read it yet. Um, I'm getting it. Okay. Up. It's okay. It's okay. Are you sure? I can wait till you. Uh, would you have a chance to read it tonight? Today? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll wait until you read it for revisions. Okay. I promise. It, I'll get back to you tonight. Okay. Can you see it, or you don't want me to? It's okay. Oh, that's it. Oh, this is it. Yeah. It's just yeah. two paragraphs. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'll I'll take a look at it later. Later. Um, and I would suggest sending it to the regular paper to to Scott. Okay. back. Yep. Okay, yes, and I apologize. I was actually working off of the the first agenda and not the revised agenda. Yeah. So there's not a revised agenda. Um it's a little oh revised packet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Revised Jen is different. Revised packet, um, which has some more information, more things to address than I had been looking at. So I apologize for that. Um, These things were going to go under topics not included 48 hours in advance. That's why they're at the bottom part of the packet instead of the top so that it wasn't an issue. Okay, um, and so so I think the other thing that we didn't address in here was um, Mr. Rhodes' um, email. Um, I would suggest and really hope that everyone would be able to take the time. I know you guys didn't have time to review this before today's meeting, but I think that this is really helpful um, information that I would suggest everyone review or um, look over before next meeting. Um, and then also there is a set of questions that I intend to pose to the town manager. However, um, just in light of this meeting going over, I'm hoping that we might be able to move that to next week as well, um, if that is okay with everybody else. Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, I think we had two different um people who were working on things with other individuals who said they had things to bring to us at the next meeting. Uh, and I expect to have some proposed language for, for pieces of the resident oversight board work uh, for the next meeting as well. And my request would be that we start our meeting with those uh, things from the, the pieces of work uh, and whatever we have to do about further process uh, wait till the end of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. I'm I'm also in agreement um, with that. Okay. Um, and so I don't have anything else left on the agenda today that was scheduled. Um, so, and those were, the, are there any other um, topics that weren't anticipated within 24 hours before this meeting that anyone would like to bring up at this point? Okay, um, so with that, I would like to call the meeting adjourned. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Is that, okay, great. Good to see you, Deborah. Yes, I'm jealous. Enjoying your time jealous. in the cave. You all come visit. Come visit. Come Are visit. you swimming a lot? Yeah. Oh yeah. Eating all those African food. 
Yes, the African food we have it is called kachupa, kachupa, and it's corn and the stew mm. and it's ah, uh, it's so nice. nice. Mm. But yes, having lots of nice, 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 nice. Okay, great. Bye. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.